Dr. Han Su Yen has just completed two books in a series, from which there will be one each year, dealing with the revolution in China. And this is a major work, a series of books, which will be based on personal memoirs, her own and those of others, dealing with the whole history of about the last 90 years, the background of the Chinese Revolution and its contemporary developments. She has the two books out in this series so far are The Crippled Tree and Mortal Flower, both published in this country by Putnam, and she is taking a uh, brief break from this series to produce a book called China in the Year 2001, which she completed just before leaving for this country. And this is a book dealing strictly with the economics and politics of China projected into the future. Then she will continue with the series on the Chinese Revolution and will presumably bring the story up to date. Dr. Han, you have traveled a great deal in the last few years. I wonder if we could begin by your telling us some of the places you've been. Yes, I live in Southeast Asia in Malaya, which is very convenient from Singapore, which is the center and a great uh, place of uh, communication, to Rome, all over Southeast Asia, every country of which I have visited, and also India, which I have visited six times, Ceylon, Japan, and, uh, uh, of course, Indonesia. I've been to the southern zone of Vietnam. I have not been to North Vietnam. Uh, and I have been also about 11 times to China, all in the last 10 years. Um, also Africa, of course, and uh, other places. It's very convenient uh, to travel these days with jets. In, uh, I can't say that I know every place as well as every other, uh, but I have tried to make a point of going more than once to a place because I think only one visit is really not enough to give anything but an impression. And God knows we have had far too many impressions which are conflicting rather than really deeper studies. Well, as a matter of fact, you say you visit these countries, but you really remain there for quite a period of time, don't you? I try to remain, and I try to, and it is rather easier for me, perhaps, uh, to uh, uh, really get down to the concrete problems rather than just the superficial aspect. In other words, it is not enough to interview the head of state and uh, the minister of information, uh, who gives you all the gist and the gen, but you have to have friends there and friends in every class. And uh, you have to have the, um, the kind of experience I have had of being taken by a tourist guide in India to the places which tourist guides are forbidden to show to tourists. Uh, well, that kind of experience is far more valuable than what the Minister of Information is going to tell you. Indeed it is. Um, you are more than just a visitor to China. Uh, you are a person who has spent a great deal of time there and, in addition, has um, uh, studied China from the documents of the Chinese Revolution and of earlier periods. And before we finish today, I would like to ask you some questions about the situation in China today. However, I think American listeners are also interested in the major focal point of attention in Southeast Asia today, namely the uh, war in Vietnam. And I would like to ask you about the Vietnam War in this framework. You mentioned in your lecture the other evening in Berkeley that the West tends to regard Southeast Asia as a power vacuum and that from this concept the West draws the conclusion that it must fill this power vacuum with Western power Otherwise, there is the danger that communist power will fill it. I wonder if you could explain uh, your concept in a little greater detail and uh, explain how you think this problem is viewed from an Asian perspective. Yes, I would like very much to, because this is really a very fundamental historical problem. And it is one that is leading all Asian historians to realize that history as even today, Western historians write history from the 19th century colonial point of view. Obviously, the idea that anywhere, where, anywhere in the world, if 
Western powers are not there, there is something wrong, is a cockeye, a wrong, abnormal idea itself. Because if you look at it objectively, why is it then that Asian powers do not regard it very abnormal that there should be no Asian power, say, in Europe? Why is it that they don't regard that there is a power vacuum in Europe if, say, there is no Asian power there to run things? As you can see, it once you twist things around, put them on the other foot, so to speak, then you realize that the very notion of power vacuum anywhere in the world where there is no white power is in itself an idea based completely on colonialism and 19th century colonialism at that. Because it was from 19th century colonialism that this idea of power vacuum was drawn. It was the idea that if there was any place in the world that was not occupied or shared out by a white or Western power, then there was something wrong with that place. And uh, this gradually gave rise to this power vacuum theory. In other words, let's occupy it, because otherwise uh, it is a vacuum. Well, that is not true. There is no place in the world which is a vacuum. And the contention of Asians and Asian historians is now that once you accept this situation, and I'm sorry to say that Western historians still accept it, you are really going back to 19th century colonialism and you are assuming that the only normality for the world is to have a white power somewhere interfering, intervening, and running affairs. And this is exactly what should not be. Asians should run their own affairs in Asia, just as Europeans have run their own affairs in Europe, without Asian interference. In the same way, there should be the latitude for the people of Southeast Asia to run their own affairs. There is no power vacuum. It is filled by the peoples of Southeast Asia themselves. To assume immediately that if the whites, if Western power withdraws, the place will be overrun by another power is simply to project your own greed and your own uh, uh, ideas on other people and to assume, therefore, that a communist power will immediately follow in in the wake of the withdrawal of your own. And yet, after 1945, the Charter of the United Nations did promise self-determination to all the peoples in the world. But so far as I can see, in Southeast Asia, this has not quite happened yet. Well, let me put the question in a slightly different way, which I think perhaps the American State Department might uh, put the question. And that is, uh, you look at these countries of Southeast Asia and you find that they are beginning to emerge from uh, the old traditional ways of doing things into modern ways of doing things. Uh, the cities are growing, they're beginning to industrialize, and the old village society with its barter economy is beginning to break down. I disagree. Oh, you do? I disagree completely. I think that uh, it is not so. I think it would be so, and there would be a change if the Western powers went away. But what I do see is that the Western powers in Southeast Asia are much more interested in keeping and propping up the old feudal structures which ought to have gone away and which ought to have been pulled down by the peoples themselves, are far more interested in keeping these up and in keeping these alive rather than in allowing the reforms and the revolutions which ought to occur and which are national revolutions granted with a certain socialist content. But, of course, any reformism now is immediately looked upon as communist, and this is precisely what is wrong. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is wrong is that the Western powers, instead of promoting reforms, promoting the kind of social revolution which would lead these countries to establish national, independent national economies, is doing exactly what it did in China and what I have described in Crippled Tree. It is killing off the national economies of these countries in order, A, to prop up feudal colonialism, outdated land ownership, and all these things which are keeping the agricultural economy stagnant and crippling the industrial economy by making it a dependency of the West. In other words, we are seeing in many areas, and especially in Southeast Asia, a kind of new colonialism, and this is the way that many people in Southeast Asia are looking upon it, including the Philippines national capitalists. And it is very interesting to me to find out that the situation is exactly the same as happened in China in the 1920s. We have 
concurrently with this economic deterioration, which is absolutely evident all over the so-called emergent world, an economic deterioration which is a deficitary balance of payments everywhere, increasing use of military suppression. We have got also at the same time an end to non-alignment and neutralism and the emergence of military satrapism, in other words, warlordism everywhere, which again reproduces the situation which I saw in China in the 1920s. And these mean that we are in a pre-revolutionary state all over the uh, so-called non-aligned countries, in which the governments are increasingly dependent on foreign subsidies and aid in order to maintain themselves by military suppression. I think maybe one of the areas in which there might be confusion in discussing these questions with many Americans would be in the area that deals with the phenomenon of communism. Now, many Americans look upon the problem as a situation in which Western parliamentary democracy is in worldwide conflict with international communism and that Southeast Asia uh, tends for the moment to be one of the battlegrounds of that conflict, that communism is hostile to the values of democracy, of uh, free speech, the right of dissent, uh, representative government, and so forth, and the welfare of the people. And therefore, for the good of the people of Southeast Asia, uh, Western power must uh, constitute a bulwark uh, against the expansion of this ideology, which in the long run will not be for the benefit of the people there. Now, what I would like to ask you is, how do you view this phenomenon of communism? Uh, is it a Western phenomenon? Is it an Asian phenomenon? Uh, do you uh, regard it as a menace to the people of Asia? Well, this is uh, rather not one question, but about five or six all rolled up together, you will agree. <laughs> yes, indeed. And it begins by saying this is what Americans think and then asks me what I think about communism. I believe that there is on this matter probably more tomfoolery and especially more self-deception, not only in America, but in many other uh, places in the affluent countries as well than in any other. And there is also a great deal of you know, ambivalence and hypocrisy because on the one hand, you profess to regard international communism as a sort of monolithic evil. And yet on the other hand, uh, Soviet Russia, which is an avowed uh, communist country, you profess to regard as having softened and therefore becoming a friend. Whereas you regard that in the other countries, there is a great danger of the same process happening as happened in Soviet Russia. Well, obviously, if you now regard Soviet Russia as a friend, you should welcome the advent of communism elsewhere, hoping that one day they will also soften up. And yet you will find that at the moment you are using a great deal of uh, military mo of money, uh, half the budget, I believe, in order to suppress the very thing which has led Soviet Russia to become not only a great power but an acceptable one. So you see, there is a basic hypocrisy in the whole argument. Well, let me interrupt you for just a minute because I think it's, it's probably overstating it to say that the American people or the American government look upon the Soviet Union as a friend as of now. I mean, for example, one of the big debates that we are about to have in this country will be over whether or not we should spend money to set up an anti-ballistic missile system. Good heavens, uh, I hadn't heard about that. Why is it? Well, because the Soviets are building one. And oh, but I thought they were that uh, that uh, that was coexistence, wasn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> you mean I that they are coexistent on the balance of terror? Well, yes. Uh, ah. In other words, there is not really friendship and trust between the two ah, countries. No. There is an uneasy balance of terror, and there is at certain levels a an opening up of relationships. All we're right. increasing some of our contacts, and we're trying to. Uh, well, we've just concluded a treaty for outer space and uh, a few other matters of this kind, but there are still many restrictions on our relationships with the Soviets, and and uh, there are many people in America who are very hostile to what uh, minor steps toward friendship have already taken place. You see? I see. So, so I think it's 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 much too strong to say that we are friendly to the Soviet Union, and if we were, we would be. Uh, getting more friendly in spite of Soviet communism rather than uh, because of it. You see. I see. Well, then, in that case, I can see that you really are very worried about communism as such. But let me tell you one thing. Uh, I don't know if you read very carefully the economic reports from China, uh, not today, but in the past. And uh, they can be put succinctly this way. 
And I think it is not only Mao Zedong who put it in a general way, but also many prominent Chinese economists in the past, is that China could have developed into a capitalist country if she had not been prevented from doing so by Western capitalism. Now, I am not a communist, and in fact, just like many Americans, I personally don't like communism myself. Why not? Because I have property. My father was a landlord. Uh, my uncle is a banker. And I belong to the 2% of the bourgeoisie in China, the very small minority that made such a mess of things that we were kicked out. But that doesn't prevent me from trying to find out exactly what happened and before trying to be objective about it. I think we must sometimes forget ourselves in order to study the world and the phenomena of the world in spite of what happens to ourselves. I mean, it's like the, the uh, say, a uh, Russian duke. Uh, well, he may have been kicked out because he was a duke. He belonged to the aristocracy. But he would look at Russia objectively and see what the good or the bad that has been done. In the same way, I tried to adopt an attitude of objectivity. And I cannot but realize that the chances of China developing Western capitalism in the past, and this is what I write about in Cripple Tree, were completely stunted by the introduction, the suppression of Chinese national capitalism by Western capitalism. The same thing is happening today in the Philippines, which is why the most hostile people to American uh, capitalism in the Philippines, which they call imperialism, are the Filipino national capitalists, the bourgeoisie, the not too affluent, but the middle class, this very small national capitalists who want industries on their own, who want to protect their own native industries, who want to build a national economy. And my contention is that Western capitalism, by under the cover or under the name of preventing communism, entering and settling and deriving profits, profits which are far greater than the export capital that they put in, into all these areas beyond their borders is not helping the promotion of capitalism, except their own, but is promoting as a reaction the advent and the increase of communism through increasing hunger, poverty, deprivation, and the failure of a national middle class of its own in all these areas. And therefore, you have the strange historical paradox that you are producing by your actions exactly the opposite of what you want. And that is my view. And my view is based on analysis, which are economic analysis of the state of the world in uh, these regions. There is economic deterioration of a terrible kind. Take the example of India. In 1956, India was a valid alternative, democratic alternative to China. Today in Asia, you will not find one Asian who believes that Asia India is a viable democratic alternative to China. And why? And yet India in the last 10 years has received more aid than any other country in the world from the Western nations. Then why is it that things are worse today in India than they ever were, whereas in China, without aid, with an embargo on it, with absolutely nothing but threat all around her, there has been the development of a national economy. Well, for Asians, what counts is success. What counts is the building of a national economy because however the West may disguise it under communism, it is not communism it is fighting in Asia today, it is nationalism. And it can't stop the waves of nationalism which are making the people fight, whether it is in Vietnam today or in Indonesia or in India tomorrow. There are revolutions in the brewing and these revolutions are national revolutions and they are for the establishment of national independence, which, in spite of all slogans, comes primarily and first before any idea of communism. I myself don't believe in communism except as an evolving thing. I think, think that every country has to evolve its own socialism. And I would be very much uh, skeptical of anybody who can tell me what the blueprint is going to be. I think the Chinese themselves would tell you that they don't really know, because nobody has yet done it, how the application of socialist theories is going to turn out. Well, if I understand you correctly, it seems to me you are saying that a national economy, even under the direction of communist leaders, is preferable to anything that the West has been able to offer the Asians so far. Yes, I think so. And I think that uh, you must recognize that the principle of doing things for yourself in your own house 
is much better than having anybody else do it for you, especially when that somebody else is intent on profit. And you see, this is where the rub comes. And I think it is made clear by the statements on aid. They, uh, they Personally, and here I am giving my own view, there is no objection to aid. But what does aid mean? Now, if you really examine the whole question of aid, you will see that it is in no wise different from the far franker direct exploitation of colonial powers in the 19th century, which called it loans at 4%. Aid is loans at 6% or 7%, so it's even worse than, than the previous loans. The previous loans were for 4 to 5% with a 40 years credit. The, previous aid, the, the present aids given, apart from a small portion which goes into grants, I agree, is a direct subsidy in order to guarantee big business and private enterprise of the Western powers from nationalization or expropriation in the countries in which they install their factories and their business. It's no more than that. It's a way to stimulate and to increase capitalism of the Western countries and to increase its invasive sharpness in the countries of Asia. And this factor is becoming extremely clear in Asia, not to the left, as you call it, or socialists or so on, but to such people even as the Minister of Finance of Malaysia, uh, Dr. Tan Siu Sin, who couldn't be more anti-communist. I mean, he couldn't loathe more the communists. But all these facts, which are perfectly economic facts of national economy, are perfectly clear to many leaders in Asia. Let me put to you a hypothetical question, and you can refuse to answer this if... Uh if you feel that it isn't appropriate, but if you were a Vietnamese today and you were confronted with the kinds of alternatives that the Vietnamese in South Vietnam confront, that is, uh, they, are, uh, they can live under a uh, uh, regime of uh, um, uh, General Nguyen Cao Chi, uh, which is supported by uh, the United States, which is an attempt to... Uh, make viable in South Vietnam uh, what we call democracy. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, it's been very successful there. As a matter of fact, um, my own impression is it's been quite unsuccessful. But on the one hand, that's one alternative. The other alternative is to uh, support the National Liberation Front. It doesn't seem to me that there is much of a middle ground uh, in Vietnam today between those two alternatives. Would you agree with that assessment of the situation? And would you, uh, um, uh, if that is the correct assessment, uh, what sort of a choice do you think would be an intelligent choice for Asians? I think you have put it simply, perhaps, but absolutely correctly, in that you say there are only now two polarizations, one which is uh, towards uh, one kind of regime, which is supported by foreign subsidy and aid, and so on, and especially by military uh, power, and the other one towards uh, National uh, Liberation Front, which actually is not a communist organization, although I am quite sure that there are communists in it. But so far as one can tell, in the National Li Liberation Front, there are many people, almost 70%, of the people in the leadership of the National Liberation Front, according to, China, to French sources, and the French should know because many of them are their students, are not communists at all, but just downright bourgeois nationalists in the National Liberation Front. I think that the issues, as they are put in the West, looking upon it as a holy crusade against communism, is the most flagrant, dangerous, and blatant lie that has ever been put. It is a... It is really a kind of clinging to the 19th century uh, idea of the Western powers, and now it is dangerously becoming the white man in Asia, remaining in Asia. And in that occurrence, the Vietnamese, who have been fighting for over 140 years, first against the French and are now fighting against Americans, are dangerously in the 
a way of simplifying matters by looking upon it simply as no foreigners on our ground. Everybody is a foreigner, and we don't want to be run by foreigners. We don't want foreign troops. In that case, yes, certainly anybody who uh, who is pro-foreign would automatically uh, be against them, and anybody who is with them would be somebody who is fighting for for the ground, for the soil, for the land, for the country, and so on. You must remember that Europe went through that phase in the 19th century of national revolutions. And I think that we in Asia are at that stage now. And uh, the, to bring in this communism, non-communism, and so on is quite wrong. On the other hand, it is quite certain that all these national revolutions in the future and these present now will have a strong coloring of communism, socialism, and so on, because you do not give them any other alternative. How can they say they are fighting for bourgeois democracy when the people they are fighting against are the democracies, so-called, of the West? They cannot... Cons they cannot consistently claim that they are going to establish, to establish the same system as the people who are invading them. I mean, uh, this would be illogical, isn't it? Let me ask you um, about the way that communism appears to have worked out in China. The, we, we get a number of reports now about the Chinese Cultural Revolution, which suggest that one of the things that is happening there is a repudiation of the traditional and ancient Chinese culture, that is, uh, the doing away with uh, many of the artifacts of the past, uh, the raiding of museums, and that sort of thing. Now, you've been in China recently, and I would like to know, first of all, I is that accurate reporting of what has happened? And secondly, if it is, what is its significance? Does this mean that communism in Asia is something that will destroy traditional Asian values? Well, the way that's put uh, is really uh, very interesting because you do realize, don't you, that the communists came to power through a military victory 17 years ago. And if it is only 17 years afterwards that they are being accused of destroying cultural values and traditions, it does mean that at least for 17 years they have been protecting them very carefully. And you are absolutely right there. I remember that uh, when Peking was being defended, so-called, by the troops of the Kuomintang under a general called General Fu Yi, his troops, the Kuomintang troops, started tearing down the Temple of Heaven, which is one of the most beautiful monuments in the world, in order to pile up firewood for themselves, and also started destroying uh, many other temples. And it was the communists who stopped all that. They even went to the extent of asking a uh, famous architect, uh, who is a friend of mine, uh, which places were of value in uh, Peking, because then they would not only not invade them, they would leave them very quietly in, and not bomb them, because they were so afraid of destroying monuments. And uh, this regard for real Chinese cultural values has even been written about by an American in Hong Kong, Ch communist China's attitude towards traditional legacy. For 17 years, there have been in every little city and town in China and even in the communes the erection of museums in order to be able to keep the old heritage going. And on the contrary, it is the first time in history, perhaps, that so much attention and care has been given to the past and to conserving the really valuable things. When this cultural revolution started, incidentally, it didn't start this year. It started four years ago in the communes. Uh, when the cultural revolution started, it is quite true that at the beginning, there were some among the young people who took part who started hacking away at a few things. They were stopped in two days. And the uh, lurid uh, pictures which were taken of stone lions being defaced did not mention the fact that these stone lions were stone lions about... Uh, 24 years old, which had been carved during the Kuomintang period and were in no way uh, traditional or uh, artistic. Uh, the two stone lines that I remember, which were shown as having been desecrated or uh, chopped up, uh, were in fact standing in front of the French embassy and had been put there by an artist in 1923. 
so that uh, you see uh, all this idea of raiding museums and all that must be seen in its proper perspective. Since then, in November of this year and in December, I have had about 16 friends going to China in order to commemorate uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen's uh, uh, 100th anniversary. And uh, they have come back with photographs, and I'm sorry I didn't bring them. I could show them to you, showing that there has been no no uh, uh, breaking down of any of the really valuable monuments. What has been taken away have been relics, mostly relics of the Kuomintang period and things which were done then. Though I do admit and I do agree and it is true that in some areas some of the youngsters got a bit too enthusiastic and did start to chop away and deface, but they were stopped immediately as soon as possible. So that disposes of the cultural heritage. Now let us talk about cultural heritage. When people talk about the Chinese cultural heritage, there is a note of veneration in their voice, uh, which they don't use towards their own cultural heritage. For instance, witch burning was one of the favorite pastimes of your cultural heritage at one time in America. Would you recommend keeping that because it is a tradition and a cultural heritage, yes or no? There are many things in a cultural heritage which are eliminated by the evolutionary process and by the refinement of the system or the change of a system. When Don Quixote was written by uh, uh, was uh, written up uh, in one fell swoop, the whole of feudal romance and literature were abolished by the fact that the masterly novel Don Quixote made fun and derided all these romantic ideas of chivalry and knights. And so in Europe, the feudal system was destroyed in order to be replaced by capitalism. I do not see why the Chinese do not have a perfect right to review and revise their own cultural heritage and to keep what is necessary and to destroy what they consider is not good. After all, in your own uh, evolutionary process, in your own revolution, in the French Revolution, in the Cromwellian times in England, there have been many defacements, some of them I admit bad and which were afterwards regretted. But so it does. Mankind renews itself by destroying the old and by establishing the new. And I think the Chinese leaders, especially in the last few months, have made repeated calls saying, the cultural heritage is not a thing that we must swallow whole, nor is it a thing that we must reject wholly. We must choose what is good out of it, and we must reject what is bad. I think they are doing that. And I think it must be pointed out that there are many things in the cultural heritage of China which were just as bad as witch burning in your heritage. For instance, foot binding, arranged marriage, and the fact that young sons were never allowed to leave their family. Uh, they had to remain in the clan and they had to work for the clan. These ideas do not fit into the industrial revolution which is happening in China, and they are being done away with. Well, one of the things that troubles many Westerners is that uh, the, the way in which this is being done, uh, the reports that we get from a variety of foreign correspondents, and even to some extent in the Chinese press and Chinese overseas broadcast, is that uh, this revolution has many of the uh, attributes of, of mob rule, that is, uh, large numbers of young people raging through the streets, uh, taking people who are distinguished leaders of the Communist Party, uh, who have undoubtedly made a major contribution to the revolution in the past, and now being led through the streets in, it's in not uh, true. humiliation and so it's forth? It's not true. It is absolutely untrue. I know very well, and I pointed out in my other uh, speech the other day, how many untruths there had been about this. There were, uh, as I pointed out in the speech I made, uh, there were reports of about 154 people having either been executed, tortured, murdered, pushed off uh, balconies and so on, out of which in about three months, 82 had to be resurrected reluctantly. Uh, in Hong Kong, most of these reports are exaggerations. I do not, of course, disagree that there has been violence. In fact, I was one of the first to say, yes, there has been violence, because I was there. I was there in June, July, August. And of this as year? If this, of this year, during the Cultural Revolution. And again, in November, as I tell you, I have had 16 of my friends going up to China during that time who came back with the fullest reports because they participated with the Red Guards in many of these meetings and so on. And the first thing that struck them was how wonderfully disciplined the Red Guards were, how absolutely 
not only sane but and disciplined, but how clean, how they cleaned up behind them, how they aided people and helped people, and how that although there were isolated cases of beating up and so on, the first thing that one must agree with is that they are totally unarmed. There is no mob rule. On the contrary, the whole idea is to debate, debate, and debate again. That there are clashes between uh, groups of youngsters, Red Guards, and other people is quite true. And that there is an awful lot of sound and fury about the whole thing is quite true. In fact, my friends themselves were engaged in violent disputes between three groups of Red Guards who were debating the notion of education, how to conduct education in the future. But I think, you know, that many of your correspondents uh, get... They aren't our correspondents because Americans aren't allowed to... No, no, I mean many of these Japanese and other correspondents. The first thing we must point out is that they get their own ideas and their own news from reading the posters which are put up by these very red guards in the streets, number one. Number two, that in many cases, I have had occasion to see the photographs of these posters which were exhibited as and, and translated, and that the translation was incorrect, completely incorrect. You see, when the Chinese say xiaomie, which means annihilate, they don't mean to kill off. They mean annihilate by debate. They mean debate to a person until he owns that he's wrong, and they call that xiaomie, which means annihilation. Now, the Japanese, and many Japanese, I'm afraid to say, uh, may in this context perhaps follow the Western line rather than the Chinese context. Uh, many of the other Yugoslav and Czech correspondents who make it, uh, uh, who, whose reports are being published here, uh, translate these terms as if they meant physical purges, physical liquidations, physical annihilations, when they are really enormous debates in which people do shout at each other for hours and hours. The second thing about people being dragged on the streets. Well, in this context, I have to tell a personal story. Uh, we doctors in Hong Kong, two of us, had a friend in Peking, an eminent doctor in Peking, a woman doctor. And we were told, and we read stories in the press. In fact, we read detailed stories of how this doctor had been hauled out of her office, had been dragged on the streets on her knees, had been told to perform all sorts of menial tasks, etc., etc., and afterwards, as I say, we were very unhappy when we had that, and we made inquiries. And not only was it not true, we got letters from that doctor denying indignantly that any of this kind had happened, but she was on the rostrum on October the 1st with Mao Zedong and the other leaders because she happens to be rather a prominent person herself, waving and smiling at the Red Guards herself because all this thing was untrue. The same thing happened about the very detailed story about Madame Sun Yat-sen's house having been ransacked and guarded. I had tea with Madame Sun Yat-sen in those times. She was not only perfectly all right, none of her houses had been ransacked, nothing had happened to her, but she was, as you know, uh, making uh, uh, speeches in November on her husband's um, anniversary in Peking. And she has since then written indignantly denying that any of this sort has happened. Another case, a famous Cantonese opera star, Hong Xian Nu, who is very well known and very popular in Hong Kong, where her films, made in China, are shown was reported in the most accurate detail as having been uh, stood up for seven hours in the streets by a bunch of red guards, humiliated, and then dragged by her own daughter and forced to commit suicide. And everything was given in such detail, even letters reproduced, signed by Hong Xianyu. All this was done in Hong Kong, until suddenly Hong Xianyu was resurrected, smiling and happy with a bunch of 16 other people from Hong Kong, overseas Chinese, who went to investigate the matter and found her in perfect health in her house and untouched. So how do you want us, who have access to the evidence, to believe more than, at the very most, 30% of what comes out? And especially, how do you want people like myself who know Chinese and who know how to interpret these documents put up by the Red Guards not to know exactly what they mean? Of course they attack the personalities of the Communist Party. Of course they will attack anybody. They have even written posters against Mao Zedong himself. They have written posters pointing out that Mao Zedong's father was really a rich peasant and not a poor peasant and things like that. All this is admitted. 
because what is happening in China at the moment is not only a thorough sifting and uh, really a real cultural revolution, a thorough shake-up, but a thing which has never been done anywhere before, which is that Mao Zedong is trying to give to the people themselves, the millions and millions of Chinese, the right and authority to run their own affairs, even against the Communist Party members. In other words, you are seeing there an attempt, I'll say no more than an attempt because I don't like exaggeration, for the first time to, pr to practice real democracy. Real democracy. And the latest that I heard was in, uh, uh, on December 13th or 14th, where for the first time there was going to be applied what is described as uh, mass democracy, i.e. the right of anyone, anyone, not Communist Party members, anyone, you, me, anyone, uh, to, uh, to inquire, to inquire in any kind of action taken by the authorities. The right of election and recall to be practiced by anyone in any popular organization. And the right and the duty and the responsibility of the citizens to keep themselves informed of all national affairs in order to exercise supervision and jurisdiction over the executive. Now, if you don't call that democracy, what is democracy? This is what they are trying to do. I'm not saying that they are succeeding, but they are trying to do. And the latest that I heard on that is that they said, in order to prevent bureaucracy, in order to prevent dictatorship and tyranny, the only way we can do it is to give as much power and democracy to the masses as possible. Now, I am not saying, and again I must repeat, that they are succeeding. I'm saying they are trying to do this, and I think that before we castigate and insult and try to and slander, we should attempt to see what they are trying to do. Well, would you say then that this cultural revolution is not a manifestation of a power struggle that's going on in the top hierarchy of the Chinese leadership, but rather something on which there is a considerable amount of consensus in the leadership and uh, general direction, and that these decisions about what in the culture, the traditional culture they will accept and what they will reject, these decisions are being made reflectively by mature leaders or uh, at the result of the whims of juveniles in the streets? I am afraid that here you are again showing that uh, your democracy has been practiced for 200 years and therefore is practiced by adults, whereas in China we have only been 17 years out of feudal tyranny. Remember that up till 1949 China was a feudal tyranny, nothing else. And therefore, you are talking now as if juveniles and youngsters were not to be trusted. Whereas in China, what Mao Zedong says, the only people we can trust are the young, because the young understand a little bit of democracy. Whereas the older ones, having been under feudal tyranny and under bureaucracy for so long, find it very difficult to practice it. You must, I'm afraid, exercise a little bit more imagination and see what is trying to be done. Now, I know that here in this country, and I have been appalled by it, there is a great tendency for the older ones to really be very hostile to their own young people. You do not trust your young people. You do not trust your own children. And I find this the most shocking thing to understand in an American democracy. You are more hostile to your, the, your own youngsters than you are to anybody else. And we, on the contrary, in Asia, where we have over 60% of our people under 30 years old, are inclined to believe that perhaps our young children have more fire, more enthusiasm, and more knowledge and more reason than some of us old people who are encrusted in the ways of the old people. Now, isn't that itself a complete reversal of the traditional Confucian ethic, which is the That's veneration right. of the old? Of that, is right. so? that is quite but right. That is quite right. Because find it, hard it has to done that so much harm. Because but filial piety, what did filial piety men mean? Filial piety me meant that the son of the family could had to become an official, practice nepotism and corruption, and everything he did was all right, so long as it was for the benefit of his family. Now, how can you run a public service like that? Well, that I, was one of the things, yeah. you see. Another thing was nobody must become a soldier or serve the country, for instance, or sacrifice his own life. For instance, no, no young adult male in China 
would throw himself in the water to rescue a drowning child because in that way he was infringing against filial piety. He was endangering his body, which was given to him by his parents. And his first duty was to preserve himself in order to be able to look after his parents. And so you had people drowning in the rivers and nobody, nobody even throwing themselves in to, to help them, even if they knew how to swim. And you've had that right until 1949. In fact, even worse. This is what Mao Zedong is trying to cut down. He says, your duty first is towards the others. And he's put it by the people, the revolutionary people must love each other, must care for each other. Your duty towards your neighbor. There is, on the contrary, a great streak of Christianity, true Christianity, in what he's trying to inculcate. And all this veneration, tradition, and filial piety sounds to me very much like sacred cow and witch burning because it is exactly on that level. And you must, I think that the West must first get away from their own holy veneration of what China has ceased to venerate, which is the Confucian tradition. The Confucian tradition has done a lot of harm to China. It has made the Chinese selfish, corrupt, nepotic, and it has produced a bureaucracy and a bureaucratic tyranny for 2,000 years. For the first time, they're trying to get away from it. This bureaucratic tyranny is so strong that even in the Communist Party, it went on. You find it in the writings of Mao Zedong. I'm sorry to quote Mao Zedong, but he really has written all this, you know. And he has written and said, the habits of petty bureaucratic feudal tyranny are so ingrained that even the Communist Party members practice it and they need supervision at all times. They need democracy. The things that you've been saying add up to an allegation that what the West is learning about China is, uh, is just completely wrong. That it's about yes. 180 degrees opposite from the truth. Yes, now I should say that it is not only wrong, uh, it, is, it is more than that. It is vicious and dangerous. It is dangerous because uh, not so much to China. It isn't dangerous to China because, after all, China is able to, so long as their internal affairs... Uh, are able to prom to go towards, to promote democracy. And this is what they are trying to do, as I said. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is difficult because you have got bureaucracy entrenched, even in the Communist Party, and they are trying to root them out. So long as they are going to be democratic, they will have the mass support and the enthusiastic support of their own people. And they say that uh, this is the most important thing, that to have the people with you. In other words, what you call consensus mm -hmm. and what you call democracy. And this is exactly what the debate is all about in China. But it is very dangerous for the West to misunderstand China. Hmm. It is well, much more mis uh, dangerous for you people. Though that raises another question. Now, how can we understand China correctly? Uh, the Chinese will not allow Westerners freely to go into China to I am observe sorry. what's going on. I am sorry. Uh, when you say Westerners, you mean Americans. Uh, there are many Westerners well, who go to the, China. They just thrown the Soviet reporters out. You know? Yes, because the Soviets threw some out and so on. That is another thing. If you count the Soviets as friendly to China at the moment, I beg to disagree. <laughs> they have thrown Soviet reporters out. It is true because precisely of all these slanderous things which the Soviet press and some others have been writing about China. And they have therefore thrown these Soviet reporters out. Uh, admittedly, they only threw them out recently after about six months of inaccurate reporting. Reporting, for instance, of tortures and uh, cutting off of fingers and, and, uh, and noses and things like that. Well, I mean, that is completely ridiculous. Nothing like that happens in China. Because uh, not only in the very first days of the Red Guards were the 16 points. You have read the 16 points? Of the Red the, Guards? Yes, yes. yes. Was, it, was it said that there must be debate but, and not force and again and again and again? But as I said before, no such thing could possibly happen. It hasn't even happened during the land reform. It hasn't even happened during the military uh, 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 struggles uh, in the last years. It hasn't happened in the last 17 years. That it would now happen as a kind of policy, I doubt very much. Absolutely, in fact. But these things would probably, again, be a mistranslation of some poster put up by a 14-year-old. You know, you can put up a poster. Anybody can put up any poster and write anything he wants. Probably a six- or seven-year-old child or even a 14-year-old child uh, putting up and saying, any enemy of China, I will cut off his hands and feet or something like that, which, again, is a Chinese phrase. To cut off somebody's hands and feet doesn't really mean to take a knife and chop off their hands and feet. What it does mean is to deter them from doing harm. But it's just one of those figurative 
uh, speeches which you use in the Chinese dialect. Of course, the history of the Chinese Revolution uh, uh, and the period before is one where there has been a considerable amount of, of violence of that type that leads people to believe that it's not there completely not, foreign to China. There has not been a violence, and this is well recognized even by your experts. But Mao admitted to around 200,000 people who were killed during the land reform period. Of course, the landlords who had killed other people. Uh -huh. Any landlord, and there were many of them. But this wasn't with who did due process of law. This that was, was due process of law by any by the real law that existed. That means the people's courts, the villages. I know myself because my family went through land reform. You know, so I'm afraid I have first hand authority on this, and my family went through it. Anybody who had who was a landlord went through a people's court. That means that their tenants were called and had to accuse them of their misdeeds and their defects and what they had done. And there was no death penalty meted out except to landlords who had killed, deliberately killed with their own hands, uh, at least one or two or more tenants. In other words, somebody who had committed murder was executed, maybe 17 mm. years later, maybe 20 years later. But there are many landlords at the moment who are not only still alive, but who are working in the communes. And one of the one of the difficulties in the communes has been that many of these landlords and landlord families have not only done very well for themselves, but some of them have even become secretaries and bookkeepers and heads of the communes themselves and have reverted to their old ways, which is why there is a clean-up in the communes. I'm afraid that to compare the killing of 200,000 people throughout the vast 600 million of China and call it a very bloody thing, when in Indonesia recently the generals who took power killed a million people just in six months, is really not quite right. In Indonesia there are only 100 million and they succeeded in killing a million people. But perhaps it is different when you kill what is called a communist and a non-communist, no? <laughs> Uh, let me ask you uh, another question about this problem of being better informed about China. Uh, those of us in America who would like to be better informed are confronted with a real problem. That is, we cannot go to China. Uh, we must rely on overseas reports. Now, is the, is the Chinese uh, government concerned enough about this problem of accurate information about what's going on in China to, to make some major effort in improving the information flow? And I raise that question because the, the only thing that I see from China regularly is the, is the Peking Review. And uh, I don't find that a really a very good or reliable source about what's going on in China uh, because I find in Language. it, uh, well, not only that, but a lot of evidence of, you know, very serious distortion of things that I know to be true. For example, they write articles about what's going on in the United States. And they have a very distorted view of the of the extent to which the American people opposed the war in Vietnam. To read the Peking Review and the editorials from the Peking People's Daily, you would get the impression that the great American masses are rioting in the streets against the Johnson policy in Vietnam, and that, that isn't accurate. Um, you, uh, you get descriptions of the behavior of the Soviets, which is also not accurate. They make the allegation that the Soviet Union is involved in collusion uh, with the American government oh, to yes, suppress the uh, uh, Vietnamese. Now, oh, the, no, the not communist to suppress the Vietnamese, let me make one other point. But, in, but definitely, what they mean by collusion is that, of course, you have the example of uh, not only Khrushchev, but even Mr. Gromyko coming around, you know, with Mr. Johnson on this non proliferation of nuclear weapons and so on. That's what they call collusion. I mean, but understanding. A group of communist parties recently. Uh, uh, have communicated on the subject of transporting material aid to Vietnam across China from the Soviet Union. Now, as near as I can determine, not just from Western bourgeois reporters, but from communist dialogue as well, in the French Communist Party Congress that took place the other day, for example, uh, many, uh, uh, where there are many friends of China, as well as people who want to uh, support the uh, communist side in the struggle in Vietnam, uh, these people argue that uh, the Soviet Union has more materiel to send to aid North Vietnam, but cannot uh, have an airlift across China to transport it. And uh, the material which goes by rail across China is apparently sent very slowly, and uh, therefore China is an impediment to the assistance uh, coming from the uh, socialist world 
to the North Vietnamese. Now, well, how yes, do we I find out like what the to, truth well, is about that? Well, once again, and I'm very grateful, but once again, you give me a big omnibus question, <laughs> don't you? I mean, you start, it's, it's really a kind of complete indictment from beginning to end. So I will start with the end, which is the Vietnamese uh, uh, aid from the socialist countries to uh, Vietnam, uh, or rather aid from the USSR to Vietnam, and how China impedes it. Uh, it seems to me that indeed you are not very well informed because Marshal Chen Yi, the foreign minister of China, did make a speech about that in September. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if you have seen it, what but I don't know whether to believe it, you say. Ah, exactly. But why is it that you believe only one side and not the other? Well, I, I don't. I'm trying to find out what the truth is, and that's why I'm asking you. Well, <laughs> uh, so far as I know, so far as I know, I would put it this way. I would say that it is true that the Chinese did place a lot of their rolling stock, not all the rolling stock, but a lot of the rolling stock, I believe, this spring, at the disposal, and last year, at the disposal of Russia in order to convey material to Vietnam. That was last year. And what they complain of is that they were told to uh, produce many wagons, which they did, and that only about a quarter of them were filled while the rest lay idle. Now, China's, rolling, China's railways are very limited. They are only still, the, the main lines, only still uh, about 60% of India's. And India is three times smaller than China. China only had 14,000 miles of railway in 1949. She's probably around about 35,000 miles of railway now, which is very limited. And as a result, uh, the rolling stock inside China couldn't be held tied up for, for a long time. Secondly, they say Russia has the second greatest merchant marine in the world. She is constantly supplying both India, Cuba, and other places with all sorts of things. In fact, in that very period of last year, 1965, 40,000 tons of material or thereabouts went to Vietnam, but 200,000 tons of material went to India and Pakistan by ship. And what the Chinese say is, why can't you divert some of these ships instead of tying us up for weeks and weeks and then only sending about 40,000 tons of material? That was last year. So as a result, the Chinese have decided that their rolling stock would not be available except in certain quantities strictly determined and to being quite sure that the material was there and was ready for loading. I have been told these stories not only um, from Marshal Chinese's thing, but also by individual. I went to Manchuria, you see, to investigate this thing uh, from the borders. That uh, they sent the railway, they sent the rolling stock, they sent the uh, engines, and then they had to wait two, three weeks before the material arrived from Russia. As you know, there is only one line from Russia, or two lines, uh, but it's really one, the Trans-Siberian, which is one line. So therefore, the Russians may have on their own side also quite a lot of difficulty sending material through China. I think that before we, uh, we investigate, before we really make up our minds about these accusations which are being launched, every one of us, especially people who belong uh, either to the left or who uh, believe in, uh, in the statements that emanate from uh, uh, left-wing parties, uh, that they should uh, go to the trouble of buying a small globe of the earth and looking carefully at the geography of Asia, at the geography of the situation. They would then realize that all these accusations... Uh, which are being launched, are made without any reference at all to the real conditions of communications in Asia, to the existence, for instance, of railways or non-railways, to the existence of the fact that there is an aeroflot, a very good line direct from Moscow and from industrial regions of, China, of uh, Russia, direct through India, Nepal, to Vietnam, or to ports like Karachi, where the merchant marine can pick them up, which will cut down the lifting of goods to Vietnam by make it about one-third or half the time 
which it would take to send it through China and not tie up in bottlenecks either the railways of China or even the railway of Russia itself because the railways of Siberia are still very undeveloped. And therefore, in order to be able adequately to help Vietnam, the Russians ought to really concentrate on the other way around. Instead, and especially their merchant marine, which is so large since they sent 200,000 tons of material to India in the same time that they only sent 40,000 tons to Vietnam. They should concentrate on this rather than to try to do it in the most inefficient way possible, which is to send it all the long, long way through Siberia and then through China to reach and then across China all the way to Vietnam. This multiplies the the kilometer lines by exactly about three. I think that this is the wrong way of doing it, even from a mechanical point of view. So why insist on it? And then, of course, you asked about the airlift. Uh, uh, Well, uh, at the present moment, I don't see how you can airlift much across, again, across China. When there is, as I said before, all these very good and excellent communication lines across India, which is also half uh, uh, half the mileage that it would be through China. Dr. Han Suyen, we've covered many topics, but we've left many uncovered. Uh, We've only scratched the surface of many things. In any case, I think we've made a good beginning of getting uh, some new insights into these very complicated problems of Asia. And I want to thank you for being with us here at Pacifica Radio today and hope that you will visit us again when you pass through this country another time on your many travels. Thank you very much. Thank you.